this. And uh, also let me uh, congratulate and uh, convey my very uh, sincere uh, applause to the, uh, to the uh, organizing committee as well as the convener of this uh, program. Because uh, you know, uh, organizing this type of event on a continuous basis during this difficult period of time. And mm -hmm. uh, also let me uh, congratulate and uh, convey my very uh, sincere uh, during this very difficult period of time uh, through which all we are passing through, irrespective of our uh, geographical location or where we are staying or where is our workplace, etc. So it's uh, obviously it is a, a, a big sense of uh, appreciation. Good morning, sir. Good morning. No. All the participants, I request all the participants to uh, not to say anything in, uh, at the introductory stage. If you have any question, either you can ask in the chat box or after a sufficient period of time, after the lecture is uh, sufficiently advanced, you can ask. But uh, at the introduction stage, uh, don't use anything like good morning and anything to disturb the resource person. This is a humble request to all. Sir, you can continue, please. So uh, I, I uh, very sincerely wish to congratulate and convey my high uh, sense of appreciation to uh, both conveners, convener, as well as the, all the members of the organizing team and uh, Department of Commerce and Management at large for undertaking this type of uh, continuous event during this difficult period of time. Uh, so uh, coming into my uh, today's uh, topic of uh, discussion, uh, let me uh, share my screen first. Sir, I have made you co-host so you can see it. Is it visible, Dr. Dhar? Yes, it is visible, sir. Please okay. continue. Okay. Now, uh, as a uh, convener sir has decided, the uh, also obviously uh, in discussion with me, the today's uh, topic of discussion should be sampling methods and uh, techniques. Now, uh, before uh, coming into that. Uh, I'd uh, like to just Dr. Dhar, actually we are habituated uh, with using Google Meet uh, and that's why uh, mm, Yes. So uh, just I request you to stop sharing and stop, share it again. Is it not visible to you? Uh, yes. No, I, no, now, the, now it is visible, sir. Okay. Now it is visible. Okay. Now, uh, to start with, uh, actually, uh, the, the focus uh, target of this uh, program, or uh, uh, focused uh, uh, stakeholder of this program, is basically the uh, research scholar, who are, uh, are very much uh, new in the research domain. And they are uh, very young at the same time. Uh, so, uh, directly coming into the uh, very specific topic, uh, it is better to have some uh, have some understanding on basic uh, of uh, research, basic aspects of statistics, in a very nutshell, obviously. And thereafter, I shall surely come into my uh, today's uh, topic, that means sampling techniques and methods. Let me first uh, share some of the uh, great quotes from uh, great statisticians as well as mathematicians. First one is the statistical thinking will one day be as necessary for efficient citizenship as the ability to read and write. That means statistical thinking will one day be as necessary as the ability to read and write. That's given by A.G. Wells. We all know the 
name of these great statisticians. And that means having some sorts of understanding in statistics is as necessary as the ability to read and write. So from this quote only, we can understand the immense importance, immense necessity of understanding some basic aspects of uh, statistics. Second one, most people use statistics like a drunk man uses a lamppost, more for support than illumination. Second quote, second quote tells us that we, before applying something, any any tool, techniques, methods, models, a test, we should know the purpose, the background of employing that particular tools or technique or method or model, etc., etc. That means. If we don't know what medicine is required to cure from a disease, then if we have a large uh, pool of uh, medicine with me, it will not serve any purpose. So we have to know what purpose a lamp serves, whether it is to offer support to someone who is drunk, or it is for uh, street lighting or eliminating uh, something else. And in line with this, we frequently uh, say that research methodology is not all about what you are going to employ, which you are going to use in your uh, in your research in your research study. Rather, rather it is the logic behind applying them. That means if I employ a very sophisticated tool for collecting or making analysis or making interpretation of a set of data. But I don't know why I am applying that particular tool or technique where a num large number of tool and tools and techniques are available that can be employed for making analysis and making an interpretation of same sets of data. Then Irrespective of how superior the methodology is, that will not serve any purpose. That means whenever we are going to employ something, whenever we are going to use something, we must know what's the logic behind applying that particular uh, method, that particular tool, that particular technique before applying them. Third one is the if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything. And a deviation uh, to some extent of this quote is uh, it will torture or it, it will confess to any crime. Crime means misleading inference. So if you torture a data long enough, it will confess to anything. That means being a researcher, you should apply statistical tool, statistical techniques, statistical methods to serve your purpose in a very honest way. In the same data, you can arrive at a very good conclusion. While if my intention is not right, if my intention is not uh, very honest, then using the same source of data, some uh, same sets of data, I may get some misleading conclusion to serve my own purpose, not to serve the purpose of extracting the inherent characteristics contained in the data set, rather to fulfill my own objectives in my own desired direction. Next one is there are three types of lies. Lies damn lies and statistics. Then can you imagine? That means statistics is the superior form of all types of lies. That means it is very uh, in continuation with the uh, earlier uh, quote. 
That means if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything. So you can use statistic. You can use statistical analysis to, to, to extract something which is not actually. And if you are if you are a very expert in uh, statistical tools, techniques, application, method, models, then you'll easily be able to do that. But that is not the purpose of application of statistics in, in academic or social science research. Next one is that all statistics have outliers. That means extreme item are always there, are expected to be there in statistics everywhere. And it is very much expected. Suppose, uh, suppose we are we are uh, going to investigate the the average weight average weight of a, a group of students in a particular class, for example, and we find that the average uh, uh, weight of the students comes to be, for example, uh, fifty five or sixty. It does not necessarily guarantee that no one in the student can have weight which is more than 100 kg. It may be there. A few students may be there whose weights are less than 40. These are considered extreme, extreme items. That means outliers. So on the basis of some statistical measures uh, like mean or median or SD or moment or skew, whatever it may be, we cannot expect that all the observations or the items in the set of data will be uh, as close to the uh, calculated value of that particular statistical measure. So I am, I am sharing this course with you to have some understanding on basic purpose of uh, statistics, basic purpose of application of statistics in, uh, uh, in uh, research. And these codes are from different dimensions. So this, with these codes, having, an, uh, having a look on these codes, we can easily understand that statistics is nothing but a set of numerical figures in plural sense, obviously. In singular sense, it, it's nothing but a subject which deals with analysis and interpretation of uh, numerical figures. So, Collectively, statistics is nothing but a, a set of some meaningful numerical figures. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, like this. So, actually, our purpose, our logic, our application of common sense will help us a lot to gain some meaningful insight from analysis and interpretation of such data. Many calculation will not or cannot serve any purpose in a very meaningful way. So with this, uh, uh, with our mind, let me uh, first, let me, uh, before uh, coming into the topic, let me uh, have some look on the basic steps or you can say the major steps that are involved in any type of research, irrespective of, of its nature. I'm not coming into that. You know, research uh, can be uh, classified into different categories depending on the purpose. Uh, so we know that all research starts with some research problem in our mind. I'm not coming into details of all this because I, I know uh, personally that these uh, have been covered by some other uh, speakers, other uh, uh, academicians in earlier classes. Uh, so after, after thinking on the research problem, we first go for review of existing literature available on that particular chosen area of my interest. And on the basis of that, we try to find out the areas which remains 
untouched by the previous researcher. And with my uh, present research, I wish to cover up or I wish to fill that particular research gap to add something in the existing body of knowledge on that particular topic. And this is the very purpose of every research. That means to add something in the existing body of knowledge on a particular area, on a particular topic, or a particular domain of knowledge. And for that, if I if I wish to uh, add something, if we wish to add something, then we must have to know what there exists at present. Suppose, so for example. I, I, I wish to make some beautification in my home, just for example. Then obviously I, I must have to know what are there in my home so that I can I can purchase something uh, uh, else from the market and make some addition. Suppose I wish to furnish my uh, home, for example then I must have to know what furniture I presently have in my home. Otherwise, it may be duplication of the furniture, while some important furniture may, be, may not be there. So if you, add, if you wish to add something, then you must have to know what you have. So through literature review, we try to investigate we try to have an understanding on what sorts of knowledge we already have on that particular topic of research on which you are going to undertake your research. And on the basis of uh, those review, we try to find out the research gap. That means those areas which have more not been touched upon by the uh, previous uh, researcher. And in my present study, I wish to uh, uh, fill that research gap. And on the basis of your research gap, you formulate your, you state your uh, objective of the study. And on the basis of objectives, you formulate some testable hypothesis, both null hypothesis as well as alternative hypothesis. And after doing all these, you have to, you have to decide upon <coughs> the, the, the aspects relating to collection of data. That means what source of data you will need for your study. What will be the possible sources from which you'll be able to get your uh, data. What particular method of uh, data collection you'll choose. Why you will go to choose that particular method while there are so many other methods available for applying for collection of data. And on the basis of all such decision have been taken, you are going to select your sample or it may be the entire population, whatever it may be, depending on your purpose of the study and the other, uh, other considerations. And uh, after that, you finally process the collected data. Process means, before making analysis, you have to make some processing on the raw data because we, you know uh, we don't uh, put uh, uh, put the vegetables or fish or meats just uh, bringing that from the home directly to the oven. Rather, before that we wash the uh, 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 vegetables or fish or meat. This is called processing. That means making them enable for analysis because you know raw data cannot be analyzed. So uh, through processing, we make the data enable for going for analysis. So in this way, we process the data. And after that, we go for analysis. And finally, on the basis of a particular uh, type of analysis, depending on the purpose, objective, needs, availability, superiority, superiority et cetera, we making interpretation on the analysis of such data. And finally, we report the major findings of the study and arrive at the conclusion. This is the 
uh, this is the you can say the 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 basic steps involved in every type of research so all this into taken care of in a framework called research design then what is research design research de design means the blueprint or plan of action for a research study a researcher makes his decisions on various aspect of his study before undertaking his study indeed just like in our day to day everyday life before doing something we don't have any plan then it is most likely that the work will not be able to be completed in desired direction planning is required everywhere for performing that particular task or work effectively efficiently and on time so like anything else uh, for research also we must have to have some uh, plan and this is called research design and in the research design we state what questions should be answered in the study that means objectives of the study what type of data will be used in the study what type of data that will be used in the study what are the sources of those data what methods what techniques of data collection will be employed how the collected data will be analyzed that means the method for the analysis and many others so that the 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 researcher can proceed for the uh, for, for for his study in desired direction to achieve the objectives of the study and purpose of the study is fulfilled without unnecessary wastage of time resource and labor suppose i am going to construct a home for me but i don't have any plan i don't have any blueprint for that i i don't have any pre plan of doing that and uh, think that uh, i shall do accordingly wh whenever a particular uh, necessity uh, comes then obviously either the house will not be constructed in desired direction or it will take much more time what than than what is expected to be needed if we uh, if we uh, uh, if we could have uh, the uh, blueprint in advance so plan actually serve us to proceed in the desired direction and uh, without having a plan for anything involves unnecessary wastage of time wastage of money wastage of inter, uh, uh, wastage of supervision wastage of uh, wastage of concentration and so on now the research design then is the framework for planning the research work and addressing the formulated research questions in a systematic and scientific manner and the reliability as well as the validity of the findings of a research study depends to a great extent on the soundness that is appropriateness suitability of the research design frame for the study and from the earlier side uh, we have seen that one major component in the research design is relating to the data to be used in the study from where that will be collected what method uh, should be followed in collecting those what methodologies what methods what tools what techniques what uh, such type of tests uh, that will be employed for analysis of the collected data and so on so under the broad aspect of research design we have sample design we can say sampling design which deals with all the aspects relating to the relating to the collection and analysis of data 
You're basically collection of data, not analysis. Now, a sample design is an integral part of research design. Mm. The basic plan or basic framework, roadmap, methodology for selection of sample. Then research design, uh, sample design focuses on the aspects relating to selection of the sample for a particular study under consideration. Thus, sample design refers to the definite plan that the researcher should employ to obtain required sample from the given population. And it consists of techniques to be applied in selecting sample as well as determination of sample size. That means how much, how much units to be uh, taken or selected for analysis in the study from the entire population. So research uh, sample design basically deals with the aspects relating to the, to the method or technique to be followed in collection of sample or collection of data required for the study as well as as well as size of the sample determining the required size of the samples to be studied from the entire population and we all know that data can be collected either from primary sources or for secondary sources and also that can be uh, collected for the entire population that means from each and every unit in the population or that can be collected from a part of the population called sample survey. Now, we all know uh, what is primary data, what is secondary data. Uh, in, a, in a very simple word, if the, uh, if, the, if the person who have collected the data are using the data for to, to serve his own purpose, then that data is called primary data from the perspective of that particular person. And if the person who have collected the data and the person who is using that uh, data, that uh, set of data is different, then it is the secondary data on, uh, from the perspective, the uh, perspective of the person who are using that. That means uh, that means uh, whether a particular data is primary or secondary depends depends on the person who is using that, not on the data itself. Suppose for my own study, I have collected a set of data. For example, in my study, just before six months, I have investigated. The, the, for example, work-life balance of the IT uh, um, uh, of the employees working in IT companies in uh, in 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 Calcutta, for example. And in another study, you are going to investigate the job satisfaction, for example, for example job satisfaction of the employees working in, working in IT sector in Kolkata. So for your study, it may happen that some of the data which I, ha I, I had collected for my own study before six months may serve some purpose for your research. So for that, you are using uh, using a portion of the data which I collected for my own study. So those sets of data is primary data from my eyes, from my perspective. And the same data is the secondary data from your perspective. That means if a person who are using some data have collected those data by his own, by, by, his, uh, by his own or her, then the data is said to be primary data. And if the data 
which have been collected by someone else or using by some, some, some else other, then the data will be said to be the secondary data. Now, uh, these are the these are methods of collecting primary data. And we all know that. Uh, still, please just have a look on uh, this. That means basically uh, there are two broad methods under which data can be collected from primary sources. One is the survey method, and other one is the observation method. Under survey method, we usually follow uh, one or more of the uh, of these methods like personal face-to-face -face interview, telephonic interview, mail interview. You all know that web-based interview, field survey, etc. And under a personal interview, there are so many methods uh, of uh, conducting the uh, interview, like a uh, door-to-door -door interview, uh, a mail intercept interview, office interview, self-administered questionnaire, et cetera, et cetera. You know, some telephonic sorts of interview methods is there. Mail interview can be uh, conducted to get response from the participants, and that can be one-time mail, and that can be mail panel, where a pool of uh, uh, pool is there uh, of the email IDs of the prospective respondent. It may be web-based interview, it may be field survey. And under observation method, it can be personal observation. Either the participant uh, is distinguished or controlled or uncontrolled. Uh, it can be mechanis mechanical observation, it can be audit, it can be Content analysis is, can be physical trace analysis. Physical trace analysis means it is not explicitly visible to all of us, but if you wish to have some uh, information, if you wish to have some insight on a particular phenomena, particular characteristics existing in a particular uh, source of information, then you have to go for trace analysis. You have to trace the uh, information. Not it is, it is easily available to, yeah, the, uh, to the uh, person who is going to explore the information. And among all these methods, what particular method of data collection of collecting primary data you will follow obviously depends on a number of considerations like cost involved in collecting the Required data because you know your yeah, cost uh, can serve as a constant because we uh, always don't have the enough opportunity to involve huge cost or a cost restriction is there cost uh, uh, cost constant is there so keeping in that mind we shall uh, go for selecting a particular method of collecting primary data second one is the time required for collection of data if we have to collect the data. In a, within a very short period of time, and a particular um, uh, a particular method, though it is very much superior than other methods, uh, involves uh, involves uh, requiring uh, much more time. And if my time is constant for me, then we will not be able to accept or uh, uh, employ that particular method. So we have to keep in our mind the time available for collection of data. And on the basis of that, we shall uh, go for selecting a particular method in uh, selecting the uh, method of uh, collecting primary data. Third one is the response rate. You know the response rate means uh, the, the percentage of getting response while you visiting the respondents. And you know it depends uh, on the method of collection of primary data. For example, Suppose uh, one of my friends, my colleague, uh, is undertaking a research work and for that he has framed a questionnaire. And he uh, sent that to me by mail and I have seen the mail. But uh, I did not or could not feel that as I forget about that questionnaire because I opened the mail and thought that I shall uh, fill the questionnaire within a few days, uh, but I ultimately forget to uh, 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 send the questionnaire because it is in the mail. But instead of that, if my friend uh, come to my home 
and uh, while taking a cup of tea, uh, I discuss on the questionnaire and uh, taking response from me. But then obviously the chance of getting the response from me will be increased. So depending on the type or method of uh, data collection, the response rate varies. So if you wish to have high response rate, then you have to choose that particular type of uh, method of collection of primary data. Next one is the speed of data collection. I need not to say anything regarding this. Survey coverage area is the area that we wish to cover in your study. And it acts as a, a very important consideration in selecting a particular method of collection of data. Biasness in collecting data, that means how much biasness will be able to tolerate in your study. Next one is the volume of data. Question diversity. Question diversity means if your questionnaire contains a diverse range of questions, then it is always better to go for personal direct interview rather than sending the questionnaire to some uh, with some uh, other ways like uh, or like uh, uh, like a mail or mail panel or over WhatsApp or that means in that case a direct interview will serve the purpose in a much better way than the indirect uh, survey. So keeping all this in mind, we ultimately select the particular method of collection of primary data required for the purpose of our study. And we all know about the sources of secondary data. So now coming into uh, the method of collection of data, which is very much related to the today's topic. Now, uh, before Coming into the method of uh, data collection, different uh, tools available for uh, data collection. Let me first uh, say something about some important uh, concept, important terms relating to getting collection of data. First one is the complete enumeration or census or population survey. Complete enumeration means, means the, the totality or aggregate of all statistical information under consideration. It is the set of all the units, sets of all the units that is available to get information on a particular phenomena on a particular characteristics. For example, if I wish to know, just for example, if we wish to know the, the efficacy or effectiveness or, or, of midday meal in reducing a school dropout, for example, this is my objective uh, of the study. So here my population will be, will be all the students who are availing the benefit of midday meal in their schools. And if my study area is West Bengal, then each and every student, each and every student in the school who is availing the benefit of midday meal shall constitute the element or unit in the population. So it is the, it is a complete uh, universe relating to a particular phenomena. And any part of that, any part of that is called sample. So in the figure, if uh, this is the population, that means the, the circle, if the circle is the population. So any part, whether small or large or containing any number of units from the population will constitute the sample. And for most of our research, For most of our research, it is quite impossible to collect information from each and every unit in the population, from the population, because of many considerations, because of many considerations. And in those cases, we go for selecting a small part from the whole population and we go for in-depth analysis of such, of such units selected for the study. 
and on the basis of that we try to we try to have some understanding about the population characteristics and on the basis of that we draw some inferences about the population so sampling is the convenient process of selecting a small number of elements from a larger target group of elements with the objective to get information about the population under study my objective not to have some understanding on the units in the sample rather my objective is to have some understanding about the characteristics in the entire population as it is not possible in most of the cases due to a number of considerations we go for selecting a small part out of the large part the entire part and go for in depth analysis on such a selected units and on the basis of that we try to draw inference about the population unit as a whole and this is the basic purpose of every type of sampling or you can say sample survey or you can say sample analysis so the basic purpose of sample study is to is to study a small part of the whole population in depth using appropriate methods associated with it and after that on the basis of analysis of sample units we draw some inference about the population unit as a whole in case of the earlier example that i have mentioned suppose my objective is to know the the effectiveness of mid day meal in reducing school dropout in the district in the in the state of west bengal and uh, suppose there are for example there are uh, five lakhs of students who are availing the uh, benefit of mid day meal then it's quite impossible to visit each and every student for the purpose of the study rather using some a uh, technique using some method i am not coming into that i uh, decided that i decided that i shall uh, study 1000 students i shall study 1000 students and visit to them and self collect required data needed for my study from them so here my objective is to uh, my objective uh, is not to make inference that mid day meal is very effective for these 1000 students not like this my objective is to know whether mid day meal is effective in reducing school dropout in the state of west bengal not among the 1000 selected for the study but due to some considerations it may be time it may be anything else instead of collecting uh, responses collecting data from all the 5 lakh students i selected 1000 students i collected required data from them i make analysis on such data and on the basis of analysis of such data that means the sample units i am going to make inference about the efficacy of the mid day meal in reducing school dropout in the state of west bengal then the basic purpose of sample study is to select a small portion from the whole and then making in depth analysis of those small unit and on the basis of such analysis on the basis of such analysis making inference about the units existing in the population at large and 
we are making inference about the total by analysis a part of that. So obviously, it cannot yield exact or 100% accuracy because I am not examining, I am not investigating all the units in the population while I am going to make inference about the population. So some sorts of discrepancies, some sorts of differences may be there, but that statistically can also be measured or specified. But why it is accepted that Instead of making investigation of each and every unit of the population, we are making inference about the population unit on the basis of uh, analysis of a very small part of that is the law of statistical regularity. And next one is the law of inertia of large numbers. These are the two most important theories on which sampling theory stands on. First one is the law of statistical regularity. And this law states that if we, if we draw a sample, that means a part of reasonable size, that means appropriate size, then it is mostly expected that, it is most expected that the characteristics of the population will be exhibited by the sample units. And that behavior of representing the behavior of the sample units in the population is very much regular in nature. That means, suppose in a population there are one lakh of people, for example, it was in a set, set of people. For example, and the characteristics that the population units have is very much expected that if we draw a sample of reasonable size using appropriate, suitable uh, method of sampling, then the same characteristics will be exhibited by the sample units in general. And second one is the law of inertia of large number. And this theorem states that as we increase the size of the sample, the, the, the characteristics, the percentage of characteristics that will be reflected by the sample units will increase. That means the sample characteristics will be able to describe the population characteristics in a more better way as we increase the size of the sample. Now, sampling means then selecting a small part of the total population and going for in-depth analysis of uh, that small part and on the basis of the analysis of such small part, making inference about the population units. And why we go for that? Obviously, that I have mentioned that it is quite impossible for most of the, in most of the situation to go for complete enumeration due to a number of considerations, due to number of, number of reasons, number of factors. And most important among these are the sampling saves a lot of time of us. It saves cost because as you increase the items to be uh, visited, item or persons to be visited or items to be information from the uh, units to be collected increases. Obviously time will, uh, much time will be required, must, uh, um, more cost will be involved. Considers manpower required for collecting data. Even if we have enough time, if we have enough money for uh, collecting uh, uh, data from all the units in the population, sometimes you'll not be able to find the required manpower if we, if we uh, wish to, if we wish to uh, collect information from each and every unit in the population. For example, you know, for many purposes, government conducts surveys at different intervals and for that specified agencies are there who have been vested upon with that type of responsibility. And that uh, organization, Apex organization, is uh, considering that 
uh, no, uh, we wish to have accurate result. So we shall not go for sampling, any type of uh, 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 sampling or any type of selecting a particular part. Rather, we shall go for complete enumeration, like census. Then is it possible? The answer is no. Because you know how much time the census requires to finalize its results. Nearly, nearly eight to nine years or even 10 years. So to make a complete enumeration for all the population of our country, the government is taking around 10 years. And you know, a large number of people working in different government organizations are being employed for that particular purpose. Still, the government is requiring 10 years. So suppose, uh, the government is thinking that no, like census, we shall go for a complete enumeration for all other sorts of uh, uh, investigation. Then from where the required manpower will be available. So if you have time, if you have sufficient money, then also it's quite impossible to make arrangement for the required manpower required for the uh, uh, complete enumeration for your uh, for uh, to serve any purpose and uh, at the same time all the manpower may not may not have the expertise of collecting the data because before collecting the data you must have to impart among the investigators how to collect the data how to get the response how to extract the response from the extra responses uh, respondents so it's some sorts of skill need to be imparted among the manpower to make them really uh, uh, serve the purpose so it's most of the time it will become impossible to manage for the required manpower if we go for complete enumeration or even if we unnecessarily increase the size of the sample. So our basic objective is to extract the characteristics inherent in the population using or employing or analyzing a small part from that and our objective will be to keep the size of the uh, sample. That means that you need to be uh, considered, you need to be analyzed as low as possible to reduce the cost, to reduce the time, to reduce the manpower required for collection of data, to ensure convenience. Next one is the sampling broadens the scope of research in light of scarcity of resources because our resource is scarce. So if you go for complete enumeration, for example, the faculty of uh, midday meal in reducing school of route, then if you wish to go for complete enumeration, then you may have to, you might have to select only a particular district or even a particular block of a district under consideration because then it will be manageable for you to collect the uh, data from each and every respondents. But that narrows down the sc scope for research of the area of the study. So if you go for complete enumeration or if you increase the size of the sample unnecessarily, then the area of your study will be reduced. That means the conclusion that will be able to arrive at the end of your study and not you will not be able to be generalized. Uh, sorry, to, just two seconds, just two seconds. Sorry, sorry to disturb you. Uh, Dr. Dhar, uh, I think I'm audible. Dr. Dhar, Vidhan. Dear participants, yes, sir, am I audible? Okay. Yes, sir, you are audible. Oh, oh. Uh, 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 next one is the mixed research findings more meaningful and useful that I have mentioned. 
and the another most important advantages most important advantage of sampling that it provides more accurate results compared to complete enumeration as in sampling non sampling errors can be controlled more easily or you, that those can be avoided that means when we go for sampling instead of a complete enumeration we'll be able to control the non sampling error which is not possible for uh, in case of complete enumeration and uh, uh, and what is uh, sampling and non sampling error what are different uh, types of errors that is generally encountered in uh, case of sampling this is these are the these are the one is the sampling error and other is the non sampling error and non sampling error are, 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 are called, called bias now what is sampling error you know uh, in sampling we are selecting a small part of the total and on the basis of those elements contained in that small part we are making inference about the whole so it is it is very much uh, likely that the uh, the estimate the, the inference will have a a a a, 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 a some sorts of uh, discrepancy among the true value and the estimated value or inferred value and it is very much common because we are not examining the all units in the population but making inference about the population so sampling error is the error that arises due to taking a sample from a population rather than using the whole population so whenever we will go for sampling we have to we have to take care of sampling error we have to uh, accept the sampling error because for example just for example there are 10 students in a class there are ten students in a class and uh, and uh, uh, their uh, their heights are available or weights are available now i am uh, going to make a sample study to know the average weight of those ten students and we have decided that we shall study four students we shall take measurement we shall take a measurement of weight of four students for example just for example then you know we can uh, choose those uh, four students in a number of ways depending on the method of sampling applied suppose there are 10 possible different ways on on which we can uh, select those four students out of the 10 students and suppose just for example the uh, height is uh, the weight of the 10 students are like this 50 51 52 53 54 56 like this now suppose in the in one sample i have selected randomly the students having the weight 50 51 52 53 just for, just for example and the, on the basis of that i have uh, i have computed the arithmetic mean like 52 kg so on the basis of that i am making inference that the average weight of the students in that particular class having 10 students is 52 kg again yeah. from the same students you have taken another sample of four students and for example the students turned out to be uh, having the uh, weight like 55 56 57 58 and you have computed arithmetic mean which comes to be uh, 56.5 for example and on the basis of that you are making inference that the average weight of the students studying in that particular class having 10 students is 56.5 kg so while the population is the same but selecting a, only a part of that for our study 
and making inference thereon. Two different persons are making different or uh, different inference about the parameter in the population. So suppose the original or the true arithmetic mean in the entire population of the stand student, for example, 55 kg. Then both of us are making some mistake. And this is due to the sampling fluctuation. And this error, this fluctuation is very much inherent in the sampling process, sampling mechanism. You will not be able to uh, reduce completely this type of error. However, if you take uh, precautions, if you follow the, uh, the, the appropriate method of collection of data, appropriate method of selecting a particular method of the drawing sample, then you'll be able to reduce that error, but sampling error cannot be reduced in total or in uh, 100%. It arises due to the fact that only a part of the population is selected for analysis and inference about the population is made on the basis of such analysis. So you are going to make inference about the whole while you are studying only a part of that. So obviously there is every possibility that will be will committing some mistake. And even if different samples of same size, within the example that I've mentioned. So when whatever cautiousness we take in selecting a sample and recording its details, there will always be a difference between the true value of the parameter in the population and its estimate obtained from the sample values. And in both in the cases in the earlier example, while we are making inference about the uh, mean uh, weight of the students in the class, we are uh, making some uh, type of mistakes. That means the true value is 55, while one of us uh, made some inference about the average weight is the 52 kg. Well, another person taking another sample made uh, inference that the average weight is uh, 56.5 uh, kg. So the difference between the true value of a parameter in the sample. Parameter means any statistical measure computed on the basis of all the units in the population. And whenever that particular uh, statistical measure is, is computed on the basis of sample units, it is called statistic. So parameter is nothing but the any statistical measure computed considering all the units on the population. If we, uh, in our previous example, 55 is the parameter, while 52 kg or 56.5 kg is the statistic. That means these are the uh, population mean and these are the uh, sample mean. So the difference between the true value of a parameter in the sample and its corresponding value derived from the sample is called the sampling error. And this type of error is inherent in the process of sampling. And the only way, the only way to avoid this error is go for complete enumeration. That means no other way is there. That means if you are opting for sampling, uh, you, if you are opting for sample survey, sample study, then you must have to accommodate a, a portion of the sampling error in your study. And this type of error can be reduced by increasing the size of the sample. It is obvious when you increase the size of the sample, more representativeness of the population characteristics will be there in the sample. By adopting appropriate sampling procedure, by selecting best representative sample, by applying the appropriate sampling procedure, sampling technique, and the magnitude of this type of error can be estimated well in advance in probability sense when we employ, employ probability sampling technique in collection of data or selecting the sample. That means though sampling error cannot be avoided in total, but if we employ appropriate method of selection of sample, if we consider a sample of reasonable size, that means appropriate size. If we take care of all the aspects, which is very much necessary 
to make the sample representative of the whole population then though these type of sampling error cannot be avoided in total still we will be able to quantify the magnitude of the error in probabilistic sense when we are attaching some confidence level for example that means we are accepting a particular percentage of probable error that means if we go for scientific method systematic method of all the uh, uh, related aspects of making a sample then we will be able to quantify in mathematical sense with the help of probabilities the maximum error that can be committed in making inference about the population on the basis of analysis of sample units and the other type of errors are non sampling error that means these errors are not associated with the process of sampling that means there is no relationship between this type of error and the method of data collection that means if you go for complete enumeration also then will also you will not be able to eliminate this type of error just by selecting just by changing the method of data collection that means this type of uh, uh, errors are not associated with the with the concept of sampling and this type of errors are called bias and this type of errors are basically committed by the human interference and this type of error occurs in the process of complex interaction between the enumerator and the informants or in processing of the collected data that means this type of errors this type of errors originates during the process of making interaction that means the in the process of collection of data as well as analysis of the data and these are caused by human factors and also difficult to detect and as i mentioned earlier that this type of errors may remain present in the census where sampling error is completely absent because if we go for complete enumeration that means we are investigating each and every unit in the population then no question of sampling arises and so no question of sampling error also arises but if we go for complete enumeration also then we may commit some non sampling error because this type of error is committed by the by the humans it may be respondent it may be uh, the, the 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 enumerators that means the person who are collecting the information it may be uh, the data analysis uh, analyst it may be researcher it may be someone else while collecting the data from the field of inquiry or while in the process of uh, making analysis of such data and non sampling error occurs at the stages of data collection as well as processing of data it may occur both in sample survey and complete enumeration and the common types of non sampling error response error you know different types of response error are there like respondent error interviewer error researcher error error another one is the non response error another one is the measurement error adjustment error processing error then these all are the sources of non response uh, non sampling error and this error can be reduced to a great extent or even can be eliminated totally by employing qualified and trained experienced personnel in collection and processing of data increasing the supervision using better equipment etc because these errors are committed by humans so if you take care of uh, all the possible sources of uh, origination of this type of data then you uh, easily can uh, eliminate or reduced to a great extent this type of error and this type of error are most commonly known by different names but uh, uh, but the name is uh, name is 
uh, much uh, informative in uh, mentioning or reflecting the uh, type of uh, errors uh, rather than example uh, can uh, describe this type of errors. But uh, I think uh, it's 11.50. So just, uh, I think it is better to skip this uh, slide. There are some examples were there regarding the uh, some non-sampling error. And you know, I have mentioned about population sample, sampling unit or sampling ele element. Uh, what is sampling trait? Sampling trait means the factors or attributes or characteristics that to be investigated through uh, sample survey or completed uh, through sample survey. Uh, for example, uh, for example, I wish to uh, know the, the, the employability, for example, of master degree holders in our state, for example. Then here the sampling trait is the, the quality of having the master degree certificate. For example, if my uh, study is relating to the relating to investigating, investigating uh, the, 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 the proportion of uh, graduates who are taking chance in master degree, for example, then in this case, my sample trait will be the persons or the students having the graduation degree. And on the basis of sampling trait, target population is determined. For example, uh, if, if my study is relating to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the employability of the master degree students, then uh, the entire population in the West Bengal is not my target population. Rather, my target population is the all the students who have completed their master degree. So the sampling trait helps us to find out or, or fix the target population for our study. And sampling frame is nothing but the listing of all the, uh, all the units in the population from which sample can be drawn. You all, you all know about sample size. Uh, this is a second consideration. That means uh, how much uh, item uh, shall be selected for the study on the basis of which we'll be able to make inference about the population. And another important uh, aspect uh, in the sampling frame is the which particular sampling techniques to be applied for collection of data because you know the reliability of the inference that you can arrive on the basis of uh, analysis of sample units depends to a great extent, great extent on the, on the aptness of the sampling technique that you have applied in collection of primary data. And I have already uh, said about parameter and statistics. Now, the most important, the most important consideration in, in, in sampling uh, design is how the sample units will be chosen from the given population. That means selecting appropriate method of sampling technique for collection of the data. That means which particular method of sampling should be applied for collection of data. And second one is the, how much unit of the given population has to be selected. That means what should be the size of the sampling, popularly known as the determination of sample size, or sample size determination. So these are the most vital aspect of sampling design. That means what particular method of sampling you should use, you should select for collection of data, required data to form your sample. And second one is the, how much units you will consider for collection of data for making such analysis and forming such sample. That means one is the method of selection of a particular technique of collection of primary data. Uh, and second one is the uh, determination of the appropriate sample size. Now, 
as time is already uh, nearing to 12. So uh, I think I, I shall uh, uh, share this slide uh, to Dr. Dhar. Uh, so if you feel interest, then you may uh, go through these slides. Just I am here uh, going through these slides and please have a look on these slides. I'm not uh, mentioning the uh, details in each of every method of sampling because uh, time is, I have already consumed my, uh, all, uh, my entire time. As we all know about simple random sampling and uh, we uh, have these are the method of it may be uh, departable or it may be lottery, uh, maybe like this. And here the uh, method of uh, advantage and disadvantage of all these methods. And second one is the stratified sampling. I am not coming into uh, uh, any details of this type of sampling. Just please have a look. I'm, uh, I shall complete within another five to 10 minutes. Uh, the second one is the stratified sampling. Just have a look, just I mentioned stratified sampling means uh, making the whole population in some strata and selecting uh, units from each strata. And there is specific advantages, specific uh, relevance of this type, every type of sampling technique under consideration. And stratified random sampling can be of uh, random in nature, that means disproportional, and it can be a proportional in nature. Uh, just for example, uh, stratified random uh, sampling uh, means we know the population in most cases is heterogeneous in nature. So under stratified sampling, by making some strata, making some uh, strata, strata is the plural of stratum, means subdivision. We are, uh, we are trying to make the whole population of heterogeneous units into some groups of homogeneous units. Just for example, I am going to, I am going to uh, know the average income per household per month of the people residing in Kolkata city. This is my, uh, this is my objective of my study. Now you know, You know, inter, uh, income uh, of the household differs significantly from uh, household to household. You all know that while some persons are there whose uh, monthly income may be more than one crore, some other persons uh, are there whose uh, uh, monthly income may be below 2,000 or 5,000 or like this. So if we take random sample, random sampling means each and every unit in the population have the equal chance to be included in the sample. For example, for the purpose uh, of, uh, of, of investigating the average uh, income per family per month in Kolkata city, I have uh, determined using appropriate, uh, some, uh, some appropriate technique that a sample of, for example, a sample of 1000 households will serve the purpose. Now, if I go for random sampling, then it may happens that out of 1,000, 800 or more than 800 households have been taken from upper income group families. Because you know, the, it depends on chance. The preference of the, uh, of the, uh, of the investigator don't have any space to uh, play any role. So in that case, the average income will be overstated. Again, it may also happen that among the 1000 respondents, most of the respondents have been selected by applying the random process to be, uh, uh, come from a lower middle income group people. So in that case, the estimation will be understated. So in this case, it is better to first making some groups of the people of the Kolkata city on the basis of the chosen characteristics. And here the chosen characteristics is the monthly income. So though the city of Calcutta is consisting of people having heterogeneous uh, monthly income, 
through making some income range. That means, for example, less than 10,000. One group. More than 1,000 to less than 25,000, for example. One group. And more than 25,000, another group. And more than one lakh, another group, for example. So after uh, grouping the whole population into these stratas, this data, I may think that as my total, as the total size of my sample is 1000. So we shall collect 250 information from this group. That means people uh, or household having monthly income of less than uh, 10,000 to 5,000, whatever group it may be, 20, uh, 250 uh, households from this group, 250 uh, households from this group, 250 households from this group, so that the equal representation of all the groups of people having different in, uh, income slabs, income range, are there in the sample. So to ensure this, we go for stratified random sampling. And just, just uh, have a look on this example. For example, in a study, 1,000 uh, total population of 1,000 uh, persons, the population consists of persons belonging to four different religions. The size of the population is 1,000 persons. And among these 1,000 persons are of uh, religion A, for example, 300 people from religion B, 200 people from uh, religion, religion uh, C, 100 people from religion D. This is the this is the proportion of different religious people, different uh, uh, religion of the population of 1,000 people. And the, for a study, the researcher decided to create a sample of 200 people, for example. So in stratified random sampling, stratified random sampling, that means disproportionate random sampling, disproportionate stratified random sampling, what we uh, do, we shall select 50 persons each from each strata, each stratum, because the size of the sample is 200 and four religions, four strata are there. So we shall select 50 persons from each strata that will give us a sample size of 200 people. That means here we are select person or unit from each strata equal, in equal number. And that's why it is called disproportionate. Why disproportionate? Let's see the another, uh, uh, that is means proportional sampling, stratified proportional sampling. Now, if we go for proportionate sampling, that is proportionate stratified sampling, then we shall select 80% from religion A because Religion A constitute 20 percent of the total population. 400 in the population, 400 people are there from religion A out of 1,000 persons. So, so, sorry, 400 people is 40 percent. Sorry, not 20 percent. It is 40 percent. So, 40 percent people are there in the population from religion A. So, in the sample we shall select 40% of the sample unit from religion A. That means 40% of 200. That means we shall select 80% from religion A. We shall select 60 another persons from religion B because the, the proportion of religion B in the population is 30%. So here we shall select 30% of 200, that means 60 persons. Likewise, we shall select 40 percent from population uh, religion C and 20 percent, uh, then 10 percent from religion D. So here, the proportionate representation of different religions are there in the sample as is there in the population. And that's why it is called stratified proportional sampling. But here, we are restricting the chance of the sample units to be included in the final sample by imposing some quota. That means 
the number of persons to be selected from religion E A is restricted to 80 persons. So that's why it is not called as a random sampling. First one is called stratified random sampling and second one, key, one is called stratified proportional sampling. And these are the advantages and disadvantages of uh, employing stratified random sampling. But the most important advantage is that it converts the population of heterogeneous character into homogeneous character. And this enables the researcher to make a comparison, make a comparison uh, between the strata, between the groups, which is not possible in case of random sampling. Though random sampling is the most powerful sampling technique, Still, stratified random sampling is superior to, uh, superior to sam uh, random sampling on the counts that it helps to convert the population into homogeneous subgroups from the heterogeneous uh, entire population. And the, it, it, enables, it enables, enables comparison between the groups, among the groups. That means, uh, what's the uh, difference between the average income, average monthly income of household belonging to lower middle income uh, group, uh, group as well as high income group. So this type of comparison in, is not possible in case of random sampling. Third one is the cluster sampling or area sampling. Uh, just have a look in cluster sampling. We divide the uh, total population into some cluster uh, on uh, some, some area. Basically, it is also called area sampling for this purpose. And obviously, there is some uh, basic difference between the cluster sampling and stratified sampling. And some slight differences are there, which makes the different sampling technique. Uh, in the slide, all I have mentioned, so if possible, or if you like so, please have a look at systematic or quasi-random sampling. I, I, I think you know that. And if not, also uh, the time as time is constant. So actually the session was supposed to be ended on 12.30, but due to some uh, uh, unavoidable reasons, I have to complete it within another, um, another five minutes, I think, or maximum 10 minutes. So just please have a look on all these slides. Next one is the multi-stage sampling. Uh, let me just systematic sampling. This is the this is the systematic sampling. That means here, what we do, uh, we shall we shall suppose before that uh, we shall uh, have a look on sampling fraction. It is related to systematic sampling. Here, suppose uh, we have a population of size one thousand households, and I have decided that I shall select fifty household out of that. Here, my sampling fraction will be 1000 divided by 5 equal to 20. That means that I shall select one household from every 20 households in the population. And if we select one sample, one population unit from every 20 population unit, then my size of the sample will be 20 into 50. That means one, th sorry, uh, uh, one into 50, that means 50. So if I wish to select a sample of size 50 out of a population of size 1000, then it means that we have to select one uh, respondent, one population unit from every 20 population unit. Now, what we'll do in case of systematic sampling, we first divide the whole population units into, into a part of 20 groups. And from the first group, that means one to 20, that means first unit, second unit, third unit, fourth unit, like this way, 20 unit. Then from these 20 units, we select a unit at random, for example. And suppose the unit uh, comes to be, for example, the selected unit comes to be, for example, seven by random. Then after that, we shall select 
here the, in example the eight unit have been selected out of 20 by applying random thing lottery and after that when the eighth unit has already been selected then we shall select 28th unit from the second group that means as i have mentioned that we have to select one unit from every 20 members so we shall proceed by 28th unit there after 28 plus 20 that means 48th unit after that 48 plus 20 equal to 68th unit in this way we shall proceed to 1000s and we will be able to form our uh, uh, the uh, entire uh, sample of size 20 and obviously uh, actually this is the this is a, uh, this is a mixed method of uh, sampling because here the first unit is selected at random but whenever the first unit have already been selected then look at the example then the chance of the units from 9th to 27 eliminated to be included in the sample so it is not probability sampling from this from uh, this part onwards up to selecting the first unit it was the random sampling because if the uh, number for example 17 was chosen then the second unit would be 17 plus 20 that means 37 so whenever the first unit is being selected the rest cannot be treated to be a purely of random in nature so it's a it has the property of both probability sampling as well as non-probability sampling that's why it is called a mixed method uh, not purely probability method or non-probability method this is the multi next one is the multi-stage sampling next one is the multi-phase sampling there is a, a slight difference between multi-stage and multi-phase sampling depending on the on the emphasis given on the group under consideration and uh, under non-probability sampling uh, uh, we we uh, know that we have a quota sampling here uh, we are imposing some quota on different uh, groups under study uh, to arrive at a sample uh, for example just for example uh, suppose a uh, fmcg company wish to uh, wish to investigate the 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 preference of a newly launched product in the market for example then uh, if it goes for random sampling then there in their study the representation of different age groups may not be there so to ensure the representation of different age groups in the sample the researcher may fix quota that my sample size is for example 500 so i shall uh, select 100 responses from the age group of more than 60 years i shall select uh, another 100 uh, people uh, from the age group of uh, age group of more than 40 years but less than 60 years in this way uh, the researcher can ensure the the uh, the uh, proportion or representation of different age groups in the sample uh, to be formed and it may be age, it may be religion, it may be other characteristics of the population, whatever it may be, then as per the requirement of the researcher, as per the purpose of the study, the researcher may fix some quota uh, on, 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 the, on different uh, items to be included in the sample. And on the basis of that, he uh, go for forming the final sample. Second one is the judgment or purposive sampling. Uh, we all know that basically uh, purposive sampling uh, is called judgment sampling and here uh, here uh, we rely entirely entirely on our own wish that means this type of sampling relies entirely on the wish or judgment or preference of the researcher and this is the purest form of non probability sampling because no unit in the universe stands any chance of being included in the sample 
except the researcher himself or herself wish to include. The inclusion or exclusion of a particular unit purely depends on the wish of the researcher. That means all the units in the in, in, uh, universe do not have an equal chance of being included in the sample. And in purposive sampling, the researcher purposively selects units to be included in the sample. And on the basis for selection of the unit, and what's the basis? Basis is the entail the wish of the wish of the researcher. <laughs> and uh, judgment sampling uh, also has uh, some uh, advantages uh, and disadvantages. Some advantages are also there, and those advantages and disadvantages are very much uh, uh, alike to the convenience sampling. Uh, uh, convenience sample, sampling is very much uh, uh, similar to the judgment sampling because uh, this sampling uh, also is a non probability sampling because here also the all units do not have the equal chance to be included in the sample. And here also, it is the only matter of chance that a unit may be convenient for the researcher to be included in the sample. And others are not. That means if a sample unit appears to be convenient to the researcher, then the sample unit are likely to be included in the sample. But in case of probability sampling, it has to be dependent on chance. No other forces or factors have any role to play. And here, sample is composed of, of any person, any unit, which most convenient to approach by the, by the respondent. And the, and the only knowledge that is required by the researcher is the nature of the universe or the you know, where the respondents could be found like this. But uh, what is the difference between convenience sampling and uh, judgment sampling? The only difference is that while the researcher employs some bit of judgment to, to, to uh, base the selection in purposive sampling, in convenience sampling, the researcher selects any unit in the universe out of pure convenience, nothing else. For example, just for example, you know, uh, uh, before during that uh, time of election, uh, TV reporters, uh, uh, different TV channels, uh, show the exit panel. results of exit poll are being shown to us. And, uh, you know, uh, TV reporters, uh, uh, what uh, TV reporters uh, do normally? TV reporters uh, stopping certain individuals, persons on the street in order to ask their opinion about certain uh, political changes. And here, the TV reporter has to apply certain judgment when deciding who to stop on the street to ask the question. Otherwise, it will be a case of random sampling. Another, another uh, uh, example maybe regarding, suppose you are, are going, to, uh, going to know the, know the uh, perception of the uh, member of the society regarding a particular budget, for example, at the time of uh, budget proposal. Then here you have to apply your judgment. Who will be your respondents? Because you know, valuable input only be given regarding the budget by an educated people. So you have to apply your judgment before selecting before selecting the uh, uh, sample sample units to get real, uh, uh, real responses from the respondent. But in case of convenience sampling, we need not to apply your, uh, our uh, judgment, rather we rely on our convenience. Just for example, 
I am going to study the 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 the, the, the satisfaction of the students studying in a particular university, for example. And for the purpose, I have decided that we shall select uh, 30 students, 30 students uh, from the university, for example. And also have decided that uh, we, for the purpose of selecting 30 students, we shall select uh, six department first. And then from six departments, we shall select five students from each department. So suppose in the university, there are 50 departments, for example. And for your study, you have decided that you shall, you shall select six departments. Then you may select six departments on the basis of your convenience from where you'll be able to collect your data more easily. And even after selecting the department, you may select five students from each department on the basis of your convenience. So this is the basic difference between the convenience sampling and uh, 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 purposive or judgment sampling. And other one is the snowballer sequential sampling. This is a very unique uh, type of sampling because this sampling technique has a special advantage in some special cases. What is a snowball sampling in a very uh, nutshell? Snowball sampling uh, is a, obviously it's a non probable sampling in which the samples have traits that are very rare. That is not easy to know for a researcher for collection of data. And, and this is a, a sampling technique in which existing sample, existing sample unit that I have provide reference to select more sample units, which is required for the study. And in this way, we proceed, that means uh, getting reference from existing samples. And in this way, we, we proceed and uh, ultimately make our uh, final uh, sample of required size. And what the name suggests, you know, in the cold places, when storm arises, storm occurs, then the ice particles in the cold area try to accumulate and joining each other to form a very small uh, uh, um, uh, round shape. It's called a ball shape. And as wind blows, the ball rolls on. And in this way, while it is uh, going rolling on, then it accumulates further ice particles. And this way, it accumulates particles, uh, ice particles, and also increases its size. Here also, we first select one or two respondents. And after interviewing one or two respond respondents, we get reference from those two respondents to get further respondents. From those two resp respondents, we get four respondents. We From four respondents, we are getting uh, uh, 16 respondents. Like, likewise, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, we uh, become able to uh, construct our desired sample. For example, if you are studying, just you are uh, studying. Uh, suppose uh, the level of level of uh, satisfaction, level of satisfaction among the members of elite club. For example, regarding regarding particular service provided in the city, for just for example. That means in my study, I am going to grab the, 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 the satisfaction level on a particular services provided in a city for the elite, uh, for the people of elite, elite class or who are member of an elite club, for example. Normally elite class uh, are the member of elite club. So now, how can I know who are the member of that particular elite club? And it will uh, uh, become very difficult for me to collect primary data sources unless 
a member of the club agrees to have direct conversation and also provide the contact details of the other members in the yeah, club. Suppose uh, I am I am I am going to study the problems faced by the homeless people in the city of Calcutta. For example, here the snowball sampling may serve the purpose in a more, more much better way. For example, I am I am I am I am uh, going to study the risk preference of the people who trades in derivative segment in stock market. For example. So it is quite difficult for me to form a sample of size 100 persons who actively uh, trade in the derivative segments segment in the stock market. So if I can identify uh, one or two uh, respondents, then it is most likely that they will be able or they will be in a position to uh, provide me some names who are known to them from whom I could I can uh, get my responses. So this type of uh, sampling uh, uh, basically uh, used in cases where the traits is very common, very rare. And also for cases where the respondents don't like to be disclosed. Even many times the respondents uh, uh, remain to be uh, secret, remain to be reluctant to give uh, secret responses. So uh, this in this type of cases, that means no official uh, record is there regarding the traits. And it is very difficult to identify the respondents. When the uh, people having the traits, having the characteristics, not willing to be identified, who possess secretive, secretiveness uh, uh, regarding their identity or like this. And in those cases, this type of uh, uh, snowball uh, sampling is very much useful. And these can be different types, like a linear snowball sampling, where one uh, respondent give reference to another one respondent. Second uh, respondent give uh, reference to another uh, one respondent. This is called linear snowball, snowball sampling. It may be exponential uh, uh, snowball sampling, and the exponential can be of non-discriminative uh, type as well as discriminative type. In non-discriminative type, uh, the researcher uh, treats all the responses in equal way, but in other case, the response then uh, the researcher uh, select one or two response dense uh, from a list of references given by the previous respondents. So different types of uh, uh, methods are there. Okay, uh, here. Um, Dr. Dhar. Sir, I am there. So, sir, I have to end. Uh, so, just I am taking two, three minutes. Uh, and So, thank you very much, sir, for your just, very just, recent just, presentation. Sir, uh, please. Just, just a minute, Dr. Dhar. I am uh, wrapping up within maximum five minutes. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, after that, the most uh, another important concept that my, we must have to know about the uh, sampling distribution of a statistic. That statistics, what I mentioned, that uh, any statistical measure, any statistical measure, then we just keep the measures uh, calculated on the basis of sample is called statistic. And the most important sampling distribution that helps us a lot in the theory of estimation as well as theory of is the sampling distribution of sample. and sampling distribution of sample proportion. These two sampling distribution helps such a loss. We know basically statistics uh, uh, can be categorized into two broad uh, uh, categories. One is the descriptive uh, analysis and other one is the inferential analysis. 
another inferential analysis, two sub uh, groups of that. One is called theory of estimation, and the other one is called uh, theory of uh, inference. So both theory of estimation and theory of inference are based on these two important sample distribution are yeah, not and uh, last one is the sample size determination uh, uh, here uh, i uh, tried to share with you the more practical way of determining sampling uh, sample size because you know no hard pass rule is there uh, because though some uh, theories are though some methods are there though some formulas are there but a number of considerations can play a major role in determining a size of the sample, though there are some uh, methods of sampling, both open sources and uh, paid software, paid statistical packages. And uh, just to uh, uh, say a few words, uh, I personally shall uh, say that first option is to go for a census, that means complete enumeration, if the size of the sample is small and it is manageable for you. Next, use a sample size from a similar study. That means if uh, you see that uh, there are, uh, there are uh, uh, some studies that they are like to your present study that already been undertaken by someone else in your past, past on a particular, on that particular topic, on that particular area. For example, I wish to uh, know the employability of uh, students who have, clear, who have passed master's degree in the state of uh, West Bengal. And previous researcher had conducted the study because three months or six months are like this. And in my study, I, I, I wish to, for example, wish to uh, uh, have an understanding on the level of intelligence of the students who have passed master's degree. So, the population is the same because the, pop, uh, the sampling state, uh, state is the same. So target population is the same for the both the studies. So here, what I can do, uh, I can, I can uh, rely on the uh, sample that had been undertaken, uh, have been selected by the earlier research. But a major shortcoming of, of the, this uh, uh, procedure is that, or going for this option is that, you will have to rely on someone, someone else correctness in calculating the sample size. And any error they have made in their calculation will ultimately transfer over to your study, transfer over to you. So keeping in this mind, you may, you may think of this alternative. Third one is the uh, using a table to find out a sample size though it is not very common for the social science researches, still for some uh, studies, a ready-made table is there where you'll be able to uh, find out the required uh, size of the sample from a given population. And this type of table is very much popular in cl clinical study, clinical research. And uh, fourth one is that, this is also very much important, is the sample size calculator. And various calculators are available online, in statistical software packages, both simple as well as complex. Complex means well, uh, different types of sampling, not random sampling, like stratified sampling. So some sorts of complexities are there in selecting the sample. Here I have just I have some screenshot, just this is the free software. I don't know much about this software. Just yesterday, I, I uh, browsing uh, that just type uh, sample size determination, sample size calculation. This site and very useful site. Uh, here, find out the sample size. Here, given the confidence level, you know the confidence level. Here is the margin of error. That means the level of uh, error, but tolerance, margin uh, error tolerance. Uh, second one is the population proportion. And here, it has been mentioned that use 50% if you are not sure about the population variance. And if you uh, uh, just uh, press calculate, then you'll get the uh, required size of the sample. Just in the second slide, see, here I have uh, pressed the calculate and I have got 385. That means 385 or more units 
are needed to have a confidence level of 95% that the real value is within plus minus 5 degree because my margin level is 5%. Margin level means the confidence interval. And confidence level and confidence interval is totally different. Confidence interval is the is the level within which plus minus of which the true population parameter is expected to lie with a confidence level of 95%. That means 5% level of significance. So I have got this result, 385. Again, when in the, just see the uh, lower slide, when I just confidence level, I have increased to 99%. Obviously, then sample size will be increased because here I increase my confidence level. That means I have to say that I am 99% sure that the population parameter will lie between plus minus five of this and this. So obviously the population sample size has increased to 666. See, uh, here I lowered the margin of error. That means I increased the confidence interval. So obviously the size of the sample will be reduced. It comes to be 167 uh, from uh, triple six. Again, here the last box, population size. And here it has been mentioned that leave blank if unlimited population size. That means you don't know the size of the population. But here I uh, put the 10,000. And thereafter, I got the result like this, 164. That means when you know the size of the population, you may put that. If you don't know that, you need not to uh, put that. Even from here, you will be also be able to uh, calculate your margin of error for given confidence level, confidence interval, and sample size. Suppose I mentioned that I shall select 100 sample. Then it will show you that. Then you have to accommodate 9.6% error in your estimation. Now, I suppose I decided that I shall not uh, tolerate uh, a error of more than 5%, for example then what should be my uh, uh, size? For example, if I consider 200, then it comes at 6.79. As you increase the size of the sample, obviously the margin of error will be reduced. And in this way, by using a sample 400, I'm seeing that the margin of error is 480. So I may do what I can do. I can lower the sample size by another 10 or 20 to reach it to 5%. So this is a very, very uh, useful uh, software. Uh, which is uh, readily available, calculator.net. And next one is the, uh, use the uh, formula, use a formula. And you know, a uh, run uh, sample size formula is the most popular and it is uh, for unlimited population. That means when population is not known, simple formula in rather than sample size, Z square means the uh, level of uh, confidence level. And P hat, that means the expected proportion of that particular characteristics in the population. If you don't know that, then may use 50%, that means 0.5. And E is the uh, margin, uh, error margin. And in this way, you'll be able to find the uh, uh, pop, uh, sample size for the unlimited population or infinite population. And if your population is finite, then you have to make some correction. Here, yeah, capital N is the population sample and other things are the same. Apart from this, the Slovene's formula is there. Uh, if you don't have any idea about the population, then may, you may use the uh, Slovene's formula. However, it is not uh, most commonly used. Even uh, the, actually the who developed this formula it is also not very much known to the researcher. Uh, another one is Tau Yaman's formula, which is basically the Slovene's formula. However, that has been developed after the development or introduction of the formula, this type of formula by the Sloven in the year 1960. And uh, Taro Yemen's given his formula in the year 1967. So actually uh, Taro Yemen's formula is considered as the Sloven's formula itself. And apart from uh, some uh, special type of uh, formula is there, the mean resource equations, static bear sampling size like this. So with this, uh, with this, I am concluding here. Uh, because we have already reached to 12.30. So over to you, uh, Professor Dhar. Here, there are some examples. Thank you so much, sir.
thank you so much sir for your very lucid presentation i think that was also helpful too because lots of technicalities also included uh, along with the normal explanation with the traditional uh, by uh, hand by calculation methods you have also explained about certain softwares that will definitely help the researcher to determine the sample size because i know from my own experience uh, lots of patients are asked regarding uh, the sampling regarding how did you choose your sample size that is the first question uh, asked uh, to the researcher and from that point of view uh, it is very much uh, uh, important that you have uh, explained very lucidly um, the different softwares in determination of the sample size especially when the population size is not known then also you uh, explain the same thing so i think that was a very very lucid uh, presentation and and i extend my heartfelt regards and gratitude to you on behalf of my department and also first of all i had to explain about the honorable vice chancellor professor mohammad das uh, she has given us this opportunity to uh, invite uh, the resource person like you you are the dean of one university and uh, you are a prominent researcher as in a professor uh, senior professor of an university of a state aided university so our researchers our students and other related stakeholders will be very much uh, uh, helped by your this kind of lecture sessions and youtube link uh, also i have shared and certification link has also been shared uh, but i extend my heartfelt regards and gratitude from uh, on behalf of my own Uh, as uh, head department of commerce and management and also from on behalf of my colleagues uh, like dr anirban sarkar dr ranjan kumar gupta dr kiranjit seth dr ashok mondol everybody uh, helped me a lot in organizing this type of invited lecture as a part of phd course work and uh, here are some very prominent persons present uh, senior professors like professor gautam mitro i have seen uh, and many others dr paramashivan Uh, dr uh, pranathas kumar pal and many other important persons present uh, so uh, definitely i will share with you the ppt uh, when it will be uh, given by professor banerji but one two questions i would like to take from the participants in person but other questions please hand over to me because uh, now professor banerji has to leave he has a very important meeting in his university uh, con convened by honorable vice chancellor so one two questions can be taken very uh, short time please uh, ask if you have any question professor gautam mitra is there others are there uh, your comment query any other thing please and uh, dear participants uh, as uh, dr dhoraj mentioned a senior professor like professor gautam mitra is there good morning sir professor mitra and i i also have seen that uh, professor deepak bishwas he also there they yes. all are very much senior very much competent in their respective field and uh, uh, please feel free to ask any question uh, to the uh, podium because uh, uh, all we know a little bit not all and uh, after uh, attending try to attending uh, one or two questions with permission of you all and obviously permission from the uh, honorable uh, chairman sir I'll and one leave. question, sir, asked to us by, by Mr. Drubo. Exactly, full name is not known to me, but the question was uh, to discuss on the manual data data reduction method. I think that is not purview of, of that is not within the purview of today's discussion because today's discussion was on on, on sampling. Uh, but nevertheless, we will keep in mind the resource person who will be dealing with the data reduction method. He he or she will be explaining it in the future yes. lecture session. and uh, any comments from dr ranjan kumar gupta dr anirban sarkar and dr ashok mondol and dr kiranjit seth our departmental committee members any comment any query or any other participants good morning to all the faculty members of our department of commerce and management because they all are very much known to me i i actually didn't presentation i could not notice that uh, please forgive me actually uh, <laughs> professor banerji is very humble but he, he is very busy too So I request to all, if you have any question, please can ask. The PPT will be definitely handed over to you when I'll receive yes, it. Yes, and I he he not... always gives such uh, this to us. So uh, no question about it. He will give it, and I'll hand it over. And I think you'll uh, you may get uh, most of the answer 
uh, from the PPT because uh, I prepare the PPT very minutely yes, as well as capability, obviously. Pudit, so you have made a very good deliberation. Thanks to you for your very nice uh, and lucid uh, deliberation uh, from your side. Thanks Thank to you. you Go ahead, Pradipto. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deepak. Thank okay, you. Okay. Thank and, you, uh, so I, request, I, I, I am requesting Dr. Dhor and all the faculty members of Department of Commerce and Management of West Bengal State University, along with uh, other participants, senior professor, Professor Mitro, Professor Bishas, to entertain, if possible, the uh, uh, some of the questions of the uh, participant, if they have. And I also know that Dr. Dhor is also uh, busy here to attend another uh, meeting. Uh, so if you don't have any question, then uh, with the permission of the convener and other faculty members, if you allow them, uh, I shall read. Uh, sir, this is uh, P.K. Paul speaking, Dr. P.K. Paul from Ryan University. Yes, yes. I have a very basic question. What are the basic characteristics of sampling in social science research, research and commerce uh, related subjects. So sampling techniques in the basic social sciences, means the society related studies mm -hmm. are used in the same way or it, are, it has some uh, basic no, differences. It, had, it had also has been uh, mentioned in my uh, slide mm -hmm. that uh, when we are trying to gather information on qualitative characteristics, mm -hmm. uh, some sorts of judgment, and other uh, factors are considered in the uh, uh, method of selection of sample. But when we are going for a quantitative research, for example, okay. uh, where we are going to uh, make analysis of the collected data, we usually go for uh, random sampling because you know most of the tests, most of the techniques are, are based on the assumption that the samples uh, have been drawn uh, on a random basis. So basically for social science research, or you can say society related research, uh, less is random sampling, more is some non-probability sampling. And that also has been mentioned in the slide. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the participants from Bangladesh too. So this was truly an international lecture session. With if the you also, if any one of you uh, from our end uh, differ, uh, in my differ from my opinion, uh, regarding the answer. You may also share your opinion. So thank you so much, sir, for your very valid value deliberation and the humbling, uh, humbly answering all the queries. And I have also given the YouTube link to all the participants in different groups so that say, they can rehear. And if they have any question, they can ask. I'll forward it to Professor Banerjee. But as uh, sir is very busy with another meeting, I take pardon from all of you. Um, uh, Professor Banerjee has to leave. Uh, so thank you so much again, Professor Banerjee. We yes. extend our heartfelt regards and gratitude to you and uh, for not being with us only, but sharing your valued opinion and valued uh, presentation. I think this will enrich our researchers and the uh, other related stakeholders too. So with this, I declare officially, uh, with your kind permission, I declare officially this session is over. And uh, certification link is uh, active. You can fill it and submit. And more than 51 participants have already received their certificate. So it is going on. But the meeting has to be wrapped up. So with the perm kind permission of Professor Pradeep Banerjee, I declare this uh, as a day. And I request you to uh, stay safe, stay at home. Uh, today morning also, we uh, had one very famous zoology faculty of Vidyasagar College left us forever. So time is not very, situation is very tough. So please try to stay at home, maintain government protocols, and please stay safe with this. Have a nice day. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Pradeep Banerjee, and thank you thank all you. the dignitaries and guests and participants. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Thank Dhar. You. Thank you, Dr. Dhar. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Very much. Thank you, sir. Happy to be here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you to all of you for being here. And my sincere thanks to Dr. Dhar once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you sir. Always thank you, sir. Uh, give me the opportunity to be associated with any type of academic event where uh, he is there. So, my sincere thanks to you and all the members of the Department of Commerce and Management and all my dear participants. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you so much. Sir.